Now the next piece of our ACID framework to cover is atomicity. And it fits really well, I think, with consistency, um, which was the last topic, because um, they both play into the way that constraints are enforced inside of SQL. Um, and the next topic after this one, which is isolation, is quite a bit different. And it uses a bunch of features that we don't generally need very much, um, that we, we tend to cover isolation uh, more from a theoretical perspective in this course, because it's hard to cook up examples where, they, where you can actually demonstrate the problems in practice. Um, because isolation requires funny concurrency stuff to happen. Atomicity is something that you're going to need quite a bit on assignment six. So um, here we are back at this exam, this not very timely example of the flights, the flight itineraries from the beginning of class. Now, the great punchline to this whole joke uh, is that assignment six, as it turns out, is about booking flights. After spending, after having a whole two months to try and think of a better topic for assignment six, I settled on booking flights. So. Life's tough. Um, we have this earlier example where uh, we have this issue where uh, we have all these flights and some have seats available and we've got travelers and a traveler wants to take a complete trip. So the idea here is that um, we've got traveler A who wants to go from Victoria to Fredericton and they do that with three flights. But, and obviously that means they have to book a seat on three different flights. The issue is that the traveler either goes to Fredericton or they don't. They don't have an option of getting stuck in Montreal. So obviously, if there isn't a ticket available on one of the flights, they don't want to book any of them. So if it turns out this flight is full, then Traveler A might just have to be told, sorry, bad luck. Maybe try again next time. So they do not want to be told, here are your tickets for this flight and this flight. Have fun. Um, either the entire itinerary gets booked or nothing does. And it turns out that, in fact, the booking of the itinerary is an operation that we want to be atomic. It either happens or it doesn't. It's in one of two states. It either happens or it doesn't. Um, and atomicity in a database system plays into that. Maybe booking flights requires small operations. So I want to book the entire itinerary by first booking this flight, then this one, then this one. And I mean, at a lower level, I book each flight by adding some rows to a table, and the table has to be written to disk, and there's all sorts of things that happen. But at the end of the day, I want to observe the entire box as either done or not done. So I want it to be one operation, not necessarily a sequence of smaller ones. And that means that if I try to accomplish the task and I fail, the entire task should be undone. Uh, and you'll notice in this case, the issue here is that uh, both of these two travelers require flight number 302, which only has one seat. So if they both go and try and book their itineraries, one of them is going to have bad news. And it's hard to tell in advance how that's going to go. Maybe they both book them at the same time. Maybe Traveler A books the night before Traveler B. We don't know in advance who is going to have a problem. But we know that any configuration, no matter how they book their flights, somebody is going to be out of luck. And we need to make sure that each traveler from the outside observes either that their itinerary was booked successfully or that nothing was booked, not that they suddenly have tickets to two-thirds of the flights that they need. Uh, and the reason we care about this is that we're using a database. Although actually the, the specific task of booking an itinerary uh, atomically isn't going to be part of assignment six. There will still be passengers that book flights. I almost added the whole itinerary thing to assignment six, but it, I decided to have mercy. Um, so. Uh, we can design a database that has all this stuff. We can have travelers, we can have flights, flights can have seats, they can go from a source to a destination. That's great. We can add constraints, we can use triggers and check constraints to verify, for example, that each flight has no more people on it than there are seats. That would be a great use of a constraint. So the constraint from the previous lecture about orders with having no more than three things in them, you could adapt that pretty easily to, to um, enforce the number of seats on a flight. Uh, and uh, we can also, you know, verify that each flight's source and destination are well-defined. Constraints can help us with this, but they can't help us moderate sequences of operations necessarily. Um, because obviously we can certainly prevent both of these people from getting on this flight because they can't fit. But what do we do if Traveler A has already booked two other flights? And so is, and Traveler B has already booked their one other flight. What do we do if we get to a, a situation where an operation is half finished but then can't be completed? Um, and that's where the idea of atomicity comes in. So we need to either book the itinerary or not. I want it to be a single operation. 
I either book it or I don't. And it either succeeds, in which case I have the tickets, or it fails, in which case I'm back to where I started. But of course, to book the itinerary, we've got like Zeno's paradox here, to book the itinerary, I have to book one flight. Right? I mean, and I then have to book a second flight that certainly consists of a sequence of small operations. So I need the ability to tell the database server that I'm about to do an all or nothing transaction. I want to do all three of these flights, and if I can't, I don't want any of them. Undo everything I've done. So we would like the booking of an itinerary to be an atomic operation. And it's a really important attribute of the ACID framework, and it's something we really expect out of any database management system, because many database systems require us to do a lot, like databases are complicated enough that in order to perform one real operation, like booking an itinerary, I might have to perform dozens or hundreds or thousands of individual row manipulations, so insert or update statements or delete statements. And I want to tell the database it's not about just one of these. They either all have to succeed or none of them have to. None, none of them can um, go forward. Now, obviously, we, we need to resolve the, the second issue that we discussed in the initial, ex when, this, when this example came up at the beginning of the semester, I also talked about the problem that would occur if both, tra like, the weird issue that can occur if both travelers try and book simultaneously, um, which is what happens if they interfere with each other's work due to concurrency problems. That's an isolation issue. We'll talk about that in the next lecture, um, but, uh, and that'll be post uh, exam four material. So here's a, a, a sort of dumb way of um, d defining a bunch of tables. We know already we probably don't want to define our tables this way if we're storing students in a student database, but suppose we have that. Um, I have a table of all of the students. I have a table of just the students that go to UVic, and then I have a table of just those UVic students that are in CSC 370. And the tables are linked together by a, cas by a, I shouldn't say cascading, by a hierarchy of foreign key constraints. So I've got my all students table, I've got my UVic students table, UVic, okay. UVic, usually I can get away with this because the U's and V's don't appear next to each other. And I've got all of my 370 students. Um, and the 370 students refer to the UVic students and there's a restrict criteria. And the UVic students refer to all students and there's a cascade criteria. Now I, I alluded to this situation um, in, uh, in the previous lecture. I finally, I mentioned it's hard to contrive an example even on the fruit database where I can use this, where we've got multiple layers of foreign keys. Well, here's one. Um, I've got three tables, very contrived, and there's foreign keys defined uh, all three between all three. So there's an issue here, which is um, uh, the well. I'll keep my diagram up, but basically what this cascade policy is saying is, if I delete a student from up here, also delete them from UVic. Okay, so I delete the student from this table, they're gone. I delete them from the UVic table, they're gone. And then I say, okay, wait, but UVic is the subject of a foreign key. So now I have to delete. I have to try and see how the foreign key acts on the 370 table. But suppose a student I was deleting was in the 370 table. Then I have to restrict. The deletion isn't allowed to occur. The operation fails. But if the operation fails, then none of these deletions occurred. But I've already done them. So what do I do? So I need the database has to have the ability to try an operation, to maybe get halfway through it, and then discover that the operation wasn't supposed to happen. So it has to undo all of the in-progress pieces. And the, the effect of that is if I do a deletion that gets hit by this restrict, the whole deletion fails and nothing happens. As you've seen in the demo videos, every time uh, an insert or update or delete fails, the database just does nothing. It doesn't leave any remnants of the operation because that would leave the data potentially in an inconsistent state. Um, so it says, yeah, so it's just going to walk us through that example. And so the key here is that if a deletion happens and cascades over dozens of layers of foreign keys, if at any point an error occurs, the whole operation is scuttled. Everything is undone, and it is, it is as if I never performed it at all. That's a really big deal, and that is part of atomicity. The idea that operations either succeed, which means fully succeed, although I consider that to be redundant. It either is a success or it didn't happen at all. Now, what's annoying about this is it's one thing to sort of, I don't know, do your research. So here on this flight example, obviously, if Traveler A already booked their flights, now flight 302 has zero seats available, flight 8060 has five seats, 
Flight 8506 has nine seats. Okay, Traveler B, before trying to, you know, at, book their tickets, would go and check, is, there a, uh, is Flight 302 available? Nope, okay, so I can't book my itinerary. They wouldn't try and do the modification. They would just go check, they do their research first. We would like to think that in this other example where I have the cascading foreign keys, that the database doesn't get halfway through it and then quit. Shouldn't the database read ahead a bit and figure out if the operation is feasible? Well, obviously, yes. If it can, it'll probably work out in advance. Will I be able to succeed? The issue is that there are some constraints which you don't know until you try violating them whether a violation occurs. It's not necessarily possible for all constraints to know in advance if the constraint will hold or not once you've deleted a row. So think about if you had to delete a row from order contents that affected the maximum order or, or minimum order size or something. You may not know until the trigger function runs, and the trigger function wouldn't run until after you do the deletion. And so we're stuck in a bit of a chicken and egg loop here. And we'll see that the theme of this lecture is solving chicken and egg problems. So the way we solve this one is we say, look, we may not be able to know in advance if the operation will succeed. The only way to know is to try it. But the problem is, if it fails midway, we have to back everything up. We have to undo everything that we've done. So the way the database might do this internally is it saves the state of all the data, tries making the modifications and acting on them. If all of them succeed, then it, it um, makes them permanent. If any of them fail, it just discards its working data and goes back to its saved copy. Now, of course, there are more efficient ways of doing that. We don't want to make backups of gigabytes of data every time we do an insert. Um, but the database needs to have the ability to roll back changes if it discovers that the changes aren't feasible midway through them. Um, and so the general rule about statements in SQL, the delete statement included, so the delete in this example cascaded through many layers of foreign keys. In one delete operation could have deleted rows in 10 different tables. But the idea is either it does that successfully, all deletions take effect, or none of them do. So the statement either succeeds or fails. And so we would view the delete statement as an atomic statement. It either works or it doesn't. And in general, that's the case with all SQL statements. An update, an insert, a delete, either it works or it doesn't. And if it doesn't, no modification occurs at all. There is no evidence of the partially complete delete statement in the database if the delete statement fails. If the delete statement succeeds, all of the results are then permanent into the database forever. Um, if we were allowed to do this, so if we were allowed to delete rows from all students, then delete rows from UVic students, and then say, whoops, can't do it, and then just give up and have some of the rows be deleted and some of them not, so abandon the operation halfway through, then we would end up with our constraints violated. That is to say, there would be students down here, like V0099999, that weren't up here and weren't up here, which of course shouldn't be allowed. The foreign key constraint prevents that. Um, and so then the database would be inconsistent. And of course, then we would just give up on the database. So we can't do that. We need atomicity because if the operation doesn't succeed, the operation can't be allowed to partially succeed. Either it fully works or it fully doesn't. So here's a very basic sort of mock-up of a flight and passenger database. Now I'm gonna, maybe in a different semester, I'd chalk this up to laziness that the mock-up's so simple, but this semester I'm gonna claim it's because assignment six is to do the same task and I don't wanna give away the answer. So I've got my flights. There they are. I've got a basic check constraint that the maximum capacity of a flight is at least zero. Um, I guess a flight can have a capacity of zero as a cargo flight or something. Then I've got the list of passengers in each flight, and each one um, contains a passenger name. Now, obviously, we want a separate table for passenger names in an actual database, but for to save space on the slide, we'll just have a passenger name and our flight ID. Now we've got a foreign key, and there's our primary key. It's just the combination of flight ID and passenger name. Um, actually, yeah, okay. Uh, so I looked this up. This is maybe dated now. I don't think anything's changed. I think I looked this up a couple years ago. Um, just like I said a minute ago, you don't want to use a passenger's name as the key. Give me a break. Use a passport ID or something, because there could be two people named Bill Bird. It turns out that airlines actually do this, though. When you get to the gate, all they care about it. Seriously, many airlines, all they care about is, hi, my name is Bill Bird. I'm on this flight. It doesn't matter if a different Bill Bird booked a ticket. They don't check. They just verify that, that your name, as long as the name on my driver's license or my passport is Bill Bird, then they let me on the flight. Now, fortunately for them, the name on my passport is not Bill Bird. <laughs> so I guess I wouldn't be able to do that. Um, 
but uh, it's William Byrd. But if, if, I, if William Byrd shows up to the gate and says, hi, I'm William Byrd, I'm on this flight, it doesn't matter if they're the same William Byrd that booked their ticket. That's sad. That's not really a 370 problem, though. There's only so much databases can fix in the world. Um, so we know that we can add constraints to this that would, for example, enforce that the total number of bookings for this flight ID is at most the maximum capacity of the flight. And just to be clear, this I'm just handing you assignment six marks here. There is actually a part of assignment six that is to enforce this constraint. So, you know, you're welcome. Uh, so uh, we can add a constraint that, that um, ensures that the maximum number of passengers uh, is, is observed on each flight. So we can't have 300 people on a 100 seat flight. Also worth considering, just like this thing, most airlines don't have that constraint. They'll book 150 people onto a 100 seat plane and then sort it out at the gate somehow. Um, so databases can help us with that problem at least. So if we had a constraint like that, any insertion that we did that would try and put too many people on the same flight would fail. Well, that's nice. Uh, and here's uh, me booking myself a bunch of flights. Who cares? Uh, I'm traveling around the world. It's going to be really... I mean, I don't know if we're still in that phase where there's nobody on planes. I'm On the news, I'm seeing that planes are now full and airlines are ending social distancing. I don't know if this is a good trip to take at this point. Um, but suppose I'm taking a trip, apparently from Victoria to Novosibirsk, um, which will be uh, I'll, quite a bit of jet lag there. So I decide to book myself four flights. Okay, great. So in this context, I have a constraint that makes sure that each time somebody adds a booking, the booking either succeeds, they get on the plane, or it fails because the plane is full. So I say, great, I'm going to book myself four flights. I'm going to book them in the order that I'm traveling, Victoria to Vancouver, uh, and then the three other ones. And so um, the, the problem is, what happens if I book this one? Good, book this one, book this one, and then this one is full. Okay, I already have three other bookings. So what do I do? Well, I don't know. The database could just tell me, sorry, Bill, you're not traveling today. And then I, the user, could then have to go write a bunch of delete statements. That's ugly because not only is there the possibility that could cause other problems, maybe deleting something from a table can cause other constraints to be violated, uh, but also I, the user, wanted to do four operations at once. I wanted to do all of these insertions, not just one at a time. I have to send them one at a time, but I want to do all of them. And if I can't do all of them, I want to do none of them. So what do we do if we get it all the way through the operation and then fail on the last step? Um, would it help at all if I were to check before I start, if I were to do my research and just check that every flight has available capacity? Well, certainly that would rule out some obvious problems, but the issue is, okay, wait, we'll, we'll save the wall of text. The issue is that maybe while I'm booking this, somebody else gets on this plane. And then while I'm booking this, somebody else gets on this plane. And then while I'm booking this, 10 more people get on. By the time I get down here, even though I checked in advance that all four had space, somebody had booked all of the seats on flight number 230. So even if I check in advance, I have to assume that stuff can happen. Even if I've checked and then 10 milliseconds later I send all four insert statements, 10 milliseconds is a long time. So if the booking process fails, I have to undo all the modifications I did. So in, in this case, they're just insertions, so I just have to go back and delete those rows. And maybe that's not too difficult for me, the user, to do. But think about it. There are lots of other things I could have done that need to be undone. I could have deleted rows. I could have updated rows. It's not as easy. I can't necessarily reverse update operations as easily as I can reverse insertions. Um, and so there's also the case of, suppose that I currently have an itinerary from Victoria to Novosibirsk, that's these four flights, and I actually have booked all four flights. And I find that there's a better itinerary that's a direct flight. Maybe I didn't know this. Maybe there are direct flights from Victoria to Novosibirsk. And I want to change my itinerary. I want to get out of all of these and onto that one flight. Well, I don't want to ever be on all four of these and the other one. I want to just swap between the two of them. And if any part of the new one is unavailable, then I want to keep the old one after all. So think about that. I don't want to just unbook all four of these and then try and book the new one, because what if the new one is unavailable by the time I try to book it? I don't want to book the new one and then unbook. So basically, I want to be able to have the binary option, yes or no. Do I get the new one or not? And if I don't get the new one, I keep the old one. So even if this, this, we can see ways around the simple case of booking these four flights in order, in general, not only is it not reasonable to expect the database user to do all this moderation, there are cases where it's hard to, to do or maybe impossible.
So even if I check in advance, I can't expect that um, I'm not going to run into this problem. It could occur during my booking sequence. So if, for example, I check in advance and then as I'm booking, somebody, bo somebody else books the last seat, as was the case in the previous example and the initial one in the lecture. So I need something else. I need the ability to, to tell the database, I'm going to give you a bunch of operations. I want you to do all of them or none of them. And the solution is something in SQL called a transaction. And the way it works is you connect to your database and you run this command, start transaction. And then you begin piling in statements. And you pile in, you do insert as many times as you want. And at the end, you run a commit operation. You might know the term commit from using systems like git. Um, the database does run, in a sense, all of your insert operations as you go. That is to say, it will generate an error as soon as something goes wrong. But it retains the ability at any point to roll back to the state the system was in before you ran the start command. So when you say start transaction, you're sort of saying, take a snapshot of time. And I'm going to do some stuff. If the stuff, if, if, if at any point the things I do don't work, roll everything back, uh, go back in time to before I said start transaction. When I say commit, finalize stuff, if everything's in order, if all the constraints are obeyed, if, if everything is still good, then make everything I did permanent. If the database successfully commits your transaction, then all of your operations must have been successful. So the transaction is atomic. If it fails, everything is undone. And well, if it fails semantically, we view it as nothing occurred at all. Uh, if it succeeds, all of the operations are performed in order. And so you can do this as the data user. You can just say start transaction, give the database a list of things to do, and the database has to work out whether that whole list succeeds or fails. The key here is it's allowed to tell you that it failed. You have no reason to expect it will succeed. But if it succeeds, then everything worked. And if it doesn't succeed, then nothing happened from the point of view of the data. So um, to start a transaction, you can say start transaction, and then uh, you can also say begin transaction because it's good to have synonyms, or just begin if for some reason the word transaction, the, pretty much the point of the lecture, if that's too much for you, you can just say begin. Okay, so um, I'm going to keep writing start transaction because that's standard SQL, and I love Postgres, but I can't really get along with it. Some, sometimes Postgres and I have some arguments. This is one of them. Why can't we just say start transaction? like a normal family. Um, so uh, I, I say start transaction, and then one thing Postgres and I can agree on is that once I'm done with my commands, insert, update, delete, whatever, I say commit. And after the commit statement, uh, if the database succeeds, everything was done. If any failure occurred, nothing was done. Uh, and that can happen at the commit statement. So if at this statement, there are some, we'll see it in a minute, there are some things that get done at the commit statement. But as it goes along, I insert this, I insert this. Suppose this flight is full. So I try inserting this, and the database says, nope, flight's full. Uh, that produces an error, and the error results in the whole transaction being abandoned, and there being no evidence that the transaction ever occurred. Um, by the same token, if I start a transaction and never finish it, so if I start a transaction and I never use the commit command, and then my connection expires or something, the transaction is abandoned. So only when I type commit is the transaction actually made permanent. And, and is it actually considered to have occurred from the point of view of the database? Now we'll talk later about um, what happens if two different users start transactions at the same time. How do two transactions run at the same time? That's a, uh, a question for the isolation lecture, not for atomicity. For our purposes, the transaction, the entire transaction, all the commands together in order, is one atomic operation. Now it turns out, for, if for some reason in the middle of a transaction you decide to end it, so not that an error occurred, but you want to manually abort the transaction, you can also say rollback, which tells the database abort the whole transaction, go back in time to before you started it, and then pretend none of this ever happened. So here's why we like this. Um, this gives us a nice happy medium between all the issues that we've been having. So first, um, we have the, the obvious problem. I could be running thousands of operations, and on operation number 9 million or whatever, an error occurs. And it turns out that completely breaks everything, and I need to roll back everything. A transaction gives me an option for that. Um, by putting everything in a transaction, either I succeed completely or everything fails. Um, even if I want to pre-check 
that things are going to work. And even if only one person is ever using the database at a time, so there's no issue of somebody else getting that seat on the flight before I do, even then there are some constraints where I don't know in advance that a constraint will be violated until I get there for a lot of reasons. I may not even know what constraints exist, but I might not know how constraints behave. Uh, and so um, it's hard for me to predict whether um, all the constraints will hold all the way through. And so how do I know that all my modifications are going to work? So a transaction allows me to try them, and then if they fail halfway through, to abandon them and have it go back. Now, it turns out, actually, if we go even further and we talk about it from a theoretical point of view, constraint functions or trigger functions are any code. I can write any code I want in a trigger. And it turns out that, as a result, the question of will this trigger function give me back an exception or not is the same as asking a question like, will this program ever end? Or will this program enter an infinite loop? Or will the result of this function be the value false? And that is, as it turns out, the halting problem. And that means that I'm actually not able to know in advance whether a particular um, constraint will hold or not, because the only way of knowing if it will hold is to run the constraint trigger, which of course requires me to ins do the insertion. And that means I have to do all the insertions before it. So because of this huge problem, the Turing completeness of the, the trigger functions, the only way I can really generally expect to know if a constraint will hold is to try it. And that means I just have to try running my insertions or updates and see what happens. And if an error occurs, roll everything back. Um, and so uh, e even if I do know the constraints and they're not Turing complete, it may not be possible for the client, so somebody who isn't actually the database itself, to easily check the constraints. Like even if I design the database, I'm sitting on dBeaver, how do I check complicated constraints by hand? That's tedious but and, and error prone, but it may not even really be possible uh, or, or feasible for me to do that. Um, and so there are a lot of reasons why having this sort of, you know, try your best, try the transaction, get partway through, fail if you need to, roll everything back. There are reasons that can be a bit inefficient, but it does does provide us a way out and we can see and there is a way of theoretically justifying that we need it because there is no pre-checking we could ever do that would get us around Turing completeness. Um, okay so uh, we've been all semester running statements that aren't inside of transactions and it's interesting to note a sort of semantic point which is that the SQL standard actually says actually whenever you're doing anything you're in a transaction. So if you don't write start transaction and commit and you do an insert statement, an ins the insert statement is put inside of a single statement transaction, a sort of mini, trans a micro transaction, if you will. Um, and that's actually why earlier when I said if you try this cascading delete that goes horribly wrong, it's way back. This cascading delete that goes horribly wrong here, if it fails midway through, the delete it never happened. Everything is rolled back. The reason isn't because the delete command is magic, it's because SQL defines that every delete operation occurs in a transaction of its own, unless you put it in, its, in a transaction of some other kind. So that makes all SQL statements atomic by default, just because transactions are atomic. Um, if you begin a transaction, um, then uh, you have to put the database in a synchronized state. So what does that mean? A synchronized state means, for example, writing all the data that needs to be written to disk out to disk. And insert statements can generally be put into memory, but if you begin a transaction, you have to save the database in its current state to disk. It turns out that that has a funny implication for this single statement transaction business. If I run, let's say, 20 million insert statements by themselves, not inside a transaction, each insert statement gets wrapped up in its own little microtransaction. And to begin a transaction, even a microtransaction, you have to write all the database to disk if it's not already on disk. So the parts of the database that are in memory have to be written to disk. So if I do 20,000 insert statements or 20 million of them by themselves, I have to write to disk 20 million times. I can't save anything in memory because it has to be written out to disk by the beginning of a transaction. If I put all 20 million insert statements in a transaction, the database is allowed to save them up and write them to disk at the end. It doesn't have to write them to disk every time they're run. So it actually turns out that beginning transactions around long sequences of operations can actually speed the database up. As a point of reference, the um, VWSN database, the one year of weather data, which is gigabytes in size, um, I, I don't think if I, I, I ran all of those insert 
um, statements in one big transaction. If I hadn't done that, if I tried running them as individual statements, which means um, writing to disk after every single weather observation is added to the observations table, I would still be waiting for the data to upload after months. That's, that's how significant the performance difference is. So using transactions explicitly can actually speed things up. Transactions also help us, through another feature, um, remedy that chicken and egg problem. So uh, formally we could call it a bootstrapping issue. So suppose I, on our order um, and products, our usual fruit database, I add a constraint that requires every order to contain at least two items. So no empty orders, no orders with one item. Every order has to have two items in it. You might be able to see the problem there, which is I can't add items to an order until I have the order in the database. But I can't have an order in the database unless it has two items in it. If I have constraints that prevent an order for contain, from containing less than two items, which I know I can do, I, I can definitely add a constraint that does this. We've seen already, that's an easy constraint to add. If I have a constraint that does that, it appears to be impossible to ever satisfy the constraint because I can't create the order until the constraint is satisfied and I can't satisfy the constraint until the order has been added to the database. Um, so what do I do? I've got the chicken and egg problem. And um, so that's this ER diagram. I, I know that I can have a constraint like this. It's weird, but I can have a constraint like this on my ER diagram. Um, and earlier in the course, people asked me questions like, okay, so how does this make any sense? How can you say an order has two, at least two items uh, or, or whatever? Um, so uh, I said, the reason this is fine is because the ER diagram describes the finished steady state of the data. After you've added all the data to the database, the ER diagram describes the ideal relationships between data. It doesn't tell you how to add data. That's somebody else's problem. I mean, it's, it's our problem now. It wasn't our problem then. Um, and a more general problem is this issue. What if I have this case of two entities? This is the captain and ship problem. I have a captain and I have a ship. Every captain has to go with one ship. Every ship has to have at least one captain or exactly one captain. How do I create a ship before I, like, how do I create anything here? How do I add a captain to the database if no ships exist? How do I add a ship if no captains exist? If these constraints must always, always be enforced, that's what consistency means. If these constraints must always be enforced, how do I do anything? if I can't um, add a captain with no ship and I can't add a ship with no captain and I can't have a captain have a ship unless I add those things separately. So what I need is the ability to tell the database system, don't worry, consistency will be maintained by what I'm doing. I wanna add a captain, myself, I guess. I wanna add myself and then I wanna add a ship that I'm the captain of. And I'm going to do that. I promise that when I'm done, all the constraints are going to be maintained. But could you give me a minute first? Could you, the database, just let me do a couple of insertions and then make sure that I've done everything correctly? So nobody else has to see the other insertions that I do. In fact, nobody can see them but you, the database, until you verify that they pass muster. But I need to tell you more than one thing. I need to run more than one command before you check the constraints. So I have the ability to do that. I have to set a few things up in advance. Um, so here is a trigger function I could use to um, prevent an order from containing less than two items. So it just all it does is it checks. Uh, I, I um, take a look at the, uh, every time I add something to the contents table, um, I just take a look whether the order number, if the number of things in that order is less than two. If it is, I've got a problem and I create an error condition. Now the issue there is what happens when I'm adding, let's say the first product to the order. I mean, if I'm gonna have two products, I have to add them one by one, right? How do I do that if I can't have an order with less than two products? Um, now, just to be clear, this constraint should be attached to both the order table and the order contents table. I wanna make sure that I can't add an order with no contents because that would be an order with zero items in it. So just and in the SQL that I post, it will, it will do that. Um, and yeah, okay, the slides agree with me. I'll do a video where I go over it again too. Um, so here's some insert statements that creates an order and then adds two products to it. And notice that when I'm done all three of these statements, the order is in compliance. It has two items, it's good. The problem is after this statement, the constraint is violated. The order has zero items. And even if it weren't, after this statement, 
the constraint is violated. It has one item. I mean, you could build in a special case where the order is allowed to have zero items. But this second problem, after this first insert, the order has one item, which is in violation of the constraint. So what do I do? I'm not allowed to create any orders with two items if I can't somehow have temporarily only one item in the order. Um, I could, of course, try this trick where I say, look, I, I get it. I, I can't add this order if it only has zero items. So how about this? I'll first add the items and then I'll create the order afterwards. Not going to work because the foreign key constraint on the order contents table won't be met. It'll say, sorry, I've never heard of order 1002 before. You're out of luck. So I've got a problem either way. I need to do all three of these things together atomically if I want the constraint to be um, observed. But if I try and run each individual um, command, it fails because the constraint isn't observed after the first one. So I have a remedy. And I mean, we can see I sort of need one. I, I need the ability to have constraints like this. Um, but I also need the ability to temporarily delay their enforcement. And so I'm allowed in SQL to um, mark a specific constraint as deferrable. And that, now to be clear, the constraint has to, t has to be explicitly marked as deferrable for it to be deferred. So you, when you create constraints, get to decide if you want to allow users to defer those constraints. If a constraint is deferrable, a user that starts a transaction is allowed to say, please defer this constraint, don't enforce it until the commit statement. So the constraint is still always in force. I can't emphasize that enough. I have emphasized it a decent amount by putting it in bold, but I, I wish I could, well, I have other options. Maybe I can emphasize it enough. Bold is fine. Um, the constraints are always enforced. Nobody can see that data in the database until your commit statement. And that is when the constraint is enforced. So I'm not losing consistency. I'm just saying, could you wait a minute until I'm done talking before you tell me that what I'm saying is wrong? That's all I'm telling the database to do. So if the constraint is listed as deferrable, I am allowed inside of one transaction to ask that the constraint not be evaluated until the end of the whole transaction. Um, so what I would do here is I would add the deferrable keyword to the constraints in question. So I could make the foreign key constraint deferrable. I don't have to defer a constraint if I don't want to, but I'm only allowed to defer it if it's deferrable. Um, I could also stick the word deferrable in my create constraint trigger. Um, command. Uh, now, what you might notice is in the previous lecture when I created these constraints, these after constraints that were triggers, I didn't even write constraint trigger. I just said create trigger. Um, it turns out that if you want something to be deferrable, you need to say constraint trigger. It has to be an after trigger and you have to have the word deferrable. Now, what's um, worth considering um, is that uh, a before trigger can't be deferrable for sort of obvious reasons. Uh, an a if you enforce your constraint after the insertion, then it's fine, I guess, for me to say, okay, do the insertion, enforce the constraint in a minute. But if I enforce the constraint before the insertion, how can I say do the insertion and then enforce the constraint? I can't delay the constraint because it's a before constraint. It happens before the insertion. So the only constraints that can be deferrable are after constraints. So you have to use an after constraint if you want to make it deferrable. And that's one reason why I think it's good to get into the mindset of generally defaulting to after constraints. Okay, so once I've marked the constraints as deferrable, I still have to ask the database to defer them. And I do this in my, after I say start transaction, I can then tell the database I just use this incantation. I say set constraints all deferred. There's that wonderful 70s SQL for us again. Set constraints all deferred. It wants to, it thinks it's English. It's just not quite there. Um, so I tell the database, please set all constraints to be deferred. If I do that, I'm allowed to, inside my transaction, perform operations that violate constraints. And to be clear, I could do all sorts of nasty stuff. I could perform, I could add duplicate rows. I could do all sorts of things. The constraints themselves aren't enforced until I hit the commit. But when I hit the commit, all of the constraints are enforced. So anything I do in here, I only get away with it if, um, if it actually abides by the constraints in aggregate. If w once I'm done every operation, all the constraints hold. So here I add my order, I add three items, and then at the end I say, okay, now I'm good, commit. Then the database goes in and it, it remembers all the constraints that needed to be enforced for all the inserts you did. So all the triggers that are queued up 
finally get run. But at this point, if I ask, how many things are in order 1001? The answer is three, which is good. So there are now three things in the order. The constraints are, are obeyed. Um, and so if we arrange our constraints properly, if we design sensible constraints, uh, we can always defer them and we can at the commit statement evaluate them at which point they will hold. So that does provide us a way around our chicken and egg problem. If every ship needs a captain, then I, I, I allow the captain and ship constraints to be deferrable. Then I create a transaction, I set the constraints to be deferred, I add the ship, I add the captain, I make the captain the captain of that ship, and then I commit. At the time of the commit operation, there is a captain and there is a ship. And so the constraints are obeyed. I'm not losing consistency. I'm just get, getting a bit more breathing room before the consistency constraints are enforced. And another key thing to note is that although I'm doing these insertions here, the database is doing them. Nobody else can see the results of those insertions until the commit statement is reached. So there's never a point, even if temporarily some constraints aren't being observed, there's never a point where anybody can see data in the database um, that appears to violate constraints. So here's the, the transaction I, or, that I had earlier for order 1002. Um, notice that because I can defer the foreign key constraints, I can even, the original, sort of what I would normally do here is I would first create the order and then I would add the contents. But actually, because the foreign key constraints are deferred, I can even do this. I can even add the contents of an order that doesn't exist yet and then add the order and then commit. Because when the foreign key constraints are, are actually uh, enforced, which is down at the commit statement, all of the stuff that's supposed to exist does. There is an order number 1002. Um, now, on the other hand, this transaction will fail at the commit. So here I have order number 1000, which all semester, as we remember, only contains one item, which of course violates our constraint. So I start my transaction, I defer my constraints, I add the order, no error there. I add the first item, no error there either. I've deferred the constraints, I'm allowed to do this. But then I, then I say commit. And at the commit, the constraints are enforced and the constraints discover that the order is too small. And so it gives an error and that means the whole transaction is voided and none of it ever happened. Um, and so even though I can put the constraints off, I still get all of the consistency assurances I would otherwise expect. Uh, this, con this transaction also fails at the commit. Everything is fine. No error occurs here, here, or here. But when I get to the commit, the foreign key constraint is enforced and there is no order 9999. And so the whole transaction is voided. Um, and uh, finally here, I create an order but add no items. I'm allowed to do that because I'm in a transaction with deferred constraints. I wouldn't be allowed to do that outside of a transaction with deferred constraints. I'm allowed to do it, but then I hit the commit and um, there is no, uh, there's no items in the order and so it doesn't meet the size constraint and so uh, the whole transaction is voided. And so the ability to defer constraints actually finally gives us, we now have a complete set of operations um, as far as what we need to accomplish to implement pretty large scale, pretty complicated data systems. And the next lecture, which is about the isolation component, um, there are some SQL features that we'll talk about, but we're going to talk about it mostly from a theoretical perspective. As far as stuff you'll need for assignment six, I know that assignment five isn't even out yet. As far as stuff you'll need for assignment six, we've actually reached all of it pretty much. As, what you'll need is to, is to create tables, to define a schema, to use insert, update, and delete statements, to run queries, to define constraints, to make sure that they are enforced, to start transactions, maybe with deferred constraints, maybe not, and then to commit transactions. And so we actually have that. We've actually now, we're now fully formed SQL programmers. So I'll post a video where I go over some of these, these um, transaction things in dBeaver. Uh, and then that brings us to the end of all the material we're going to need for the July 13th exam. Uh, and after July 13th, after exam number four, um, the topic of assignment five, assignment five will be mostly a, a theoretical sort of a written assignment. Um, and then assignment six you'll have until um, early August to complete. So it's sort of a project style thing.